forward. Okay, so good morning, happy Friday. Uh, I posted, you might have you might have seen it already, but I just wanted to highlight because we're gonna, uh, hopefully we'll, I, I think we will finish the material today, which would be really nice because then we have tests next week and that will allow us to kind of see all the material uh, on a test before the final exam. And then we'll do uh, uh, some review where I'll tell you what to expect exactly for the final exam. And then uh, I'll have kind of some cherry picked problems. We won't be able to go through all of the different types of problems, but kind of the, the harder problems uh, we'll do some more review on uh, and that's next Friday. So um, today we're gonna do uh, indeterminate forms and uh, optimization problems. Optimization problems are word problems so they can be a little bit tricky, just like related rates. Um, and so what I did was I, I took problems that I had worked through before, kind of previously in other classes, uh, and I posted kind of more examples. Um, and I guess my internet is really slow today. Um, so here you have more examples that are worked through um, and uh, just to kind of see how we would do some other types of problems. We'll, we'll have time to work through three problems, hopefully. Uh, but of course, I want to kind of expose you to all these different types of problems. So have a look at those um, and, and kind of, there's, a, lot, there's a, a couple of different ways of solving those problems. So sometimes I'll have kind of option one for solving it, option two for solving it and that kind of thing. So, um, but have a look at those and um, yeah. Uh, I did post quiz eight. Now quiz eight, remember we decided was uh, going to be optional. Okay, so quiz number eight is a bonus quiz, right? So I'll just uh, drop your lowest quiz. And, and if that happens to be quiz eight, if you don't do it, then that's fine. Then there's no harm, right? But uh, if you wanted to kind of boost your quiz grade, then you can do quiz eight, uh, which is on sections uh, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, oops. Um, and 4.7, basically this week's stuff. And it is due uh, Tuesday, just before the, our test is on Wednesday, right? So Tuesday, uh, April 13th at 11.59 uh, p.m. Okay. Good, okay. So, uh, oh yeah, and I'll post a, a practice test just like you've had for uh, for the other tests, right? And so I haven't made it yet, uh, but I will. So it's on my to-do list here. Uh, so you'll have a practice test for test three and then uh, test number three is on Wednesday. April 14th. Crazy. Things are coming together. Okay. Oh, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, uh, let's get cracking, shall we? So, 4.4 um, is probably the, uh, the most fun section that we do, or I think so, because it, um, it gives us a shortcut to calculating limits. There are some, um, some kind of drawbacks that we're going to talk about, but uh, it does make finding some limits a lot easier. Okay, so um, it's called indeterminate forms. 
and I saw I have a, a typo on the handout, it should be and L'Hopital's rule. So L apostrophe Los L'Hospital's L'Hopital. Sometimes uh, people spell it uh, or L'Hopital. Rule. He spelled it with an S, so that's why I spell it with an S. But uh, sometimes people like to make it fancy with a little, uh, I can't remember what the hat accent is called. Anyways, uh, so sometimes you'll see L'Hopital's or, or L'Hopital's, I mean, you say, say them the same, so uh, hard to differentiate there. But uh, L'Hopital's rule is really, really fun. So remember way back in chapter two when we were doing limits, right? So uh, in chapter two, in chapter two, when we were finding limits, and I know no one likes limits, or maybe that's just me, I don't like limits, uh, but most people don't like limits. So uh, in chapter two, when we were finding limits, we saw, we saw some limits. And if you kind of just plug in the values into the limits, uh, sometimes we saw things like zero over zero or, okay, infinity over infinity. And those are what we call indeterminate forms. So we saw uh, limits of the form zero over zero or, and these in infinite limits, uh, can either be positive or negative as long as it goes to infinity. Uh, it doesn't matter. We, we generalize this as just, uh, we can just say that it's infinity over infinity. We don't care about the sign. So it allows for positive or negatives. Uh, they can even go in, in different directions. Um, so we did uh, develop tools to deal with this, right? To, to kind of work around how do, we, uh, how do we deal with this, right? Especially if we're taking limits to infinity, then we divide it by the, the highest power of X in the denominator, right? If we ended up with zero over zero, so essentially if we have zero in the denominator, that's bad news, right? So then sometimes we had to factor and cancel or we rationalized, right? So, so we developed tools to deal with this. So we already know how to deal with these things. That's not the problem. Uh, I, I'm just giving you an easier way to deal with it potentially. So we learned tools to deal with, uh, and I'll say kind of deal in, in air quotes, because I mean, to deal with these, uh, indeterminate forms right and we said well I could uh, I could factor and cancel right maybe try that factor and cancel usually that's if you're you're dividing by zero maybe I can rationalize change the denominator um, by multiplying by uh, the conjugate of itself, right? So maybe, maybe that's a way to deal with it. Uh, we also did things like divide by the highest power of x, divide by the highest power of x in the denominator. That ended up working if we were taking limits as x go to infinity, 
right? And then these two are kind of dealing with the zero over zero situation. And then this one's dealing with the infinity over infinity situation, most likely. I'm not going to write that down because it, it's not necessarily always true. So I don't, I'm not committing. Uh, so in the handout, there are two examples where they apply these, um, these methods, right? And so here, I'll just kind of bring it all in, or maybe I'll bring this in. No, we don't need to look at these, but I will zoom in here so we can talk about them, right? And so, okay. If you have something like, if you want to take the limit as X goes to one of X squared minus X over X squared minus one, well, if you just plug in one here, you end up with one squared minus one, that's zero. And then one squared minus one is also zero. So I'm dividing by zero. I can't do that, right? And so we ended up factoring and canceling the X minus one, which was the one making a mess, right? And so we try to, to kind of get rid of the one that's making a mess. Then we were able to say, okay, well, if I rewrite that function as x over x plus one, then I can evaluate it at x equals one and it's one over two. Right. So now if we have a look at kind of a similar function, right? But now we're taking x as x goes to infinity of x squared minus one over two x squared plus one. Right. So then what we did as x goes to infinity, we divided by the highest power of x from the denominator, which is x squared, right? So x squared over x squared is one. And then one over x squared as x goes to infinity, I'm dividing one by a really, really, really large number. It's going to go to zero, All right? So that's how we kind of get rid of those. And then uh, two X squared over X squared is two. And then one over X squared is just gonna go to zero as you take the limit, right? So then we find that this limit, it, they both exist even though initially it doesn't look like it, right? If you pretend, pretend to put in infinity in for X here, uh, you're just gonna end up with infinity squared minus one over two times infinity squared plus one, uh, essentially infinity over infinity. And so that's how we recognize these indeterminate forms. So this is the one I want to grab. Let's see here. Uh, I'll just say, see the handout uh, for two examples from chapter two. Right, that's not what this section is about. It's just highlighting what we've done in the past. Okay, in comes L'Hopital's rule, and it is amazing. Assuming that F and G are differentiable, and that the derivative of G is not equal to zero, then, and kind of skipping ahead here, if you have an indeterminate form, either zero over zero or infinity over infinity, notice that it doesn't apply for zero over infinity or vice versa, right? It has to be zero over zero or infinity over infinity, right? Then what happens is you can rewrite the limit as X goes to A, A can be anything, uh, of f of x over g of x, we're allowed to rewrite it as the derivative of f, nice, right, uh, over the derivative of g. So L'Hopital's rule says, okay, how about you, tr you try it and you just take the derivative of f and the derivative of g. Notice that this is not the derivative of f over g, it's, it's the individual der derivatives, right? So you're not using the quotient rule, you're just Take the derivative of the top and the bottom and then evaluate the limit. Right? Uh, so then this limit, maybe it becomes a number 
or maybe it goes to infinity or negative infinity, but that just means that the overall limit would go to infinity or negative infinity, which is a special way of not existing, right? But, um, but then sometimes it's easier to see if you take the, the derivative uh, of the top and the bottom and then apply the, the limit. So here, I will say that it's, it's really important, right? Oops, important the limit must be of the form zero over zero or infinity over infinity. Okay. So that's that's really important that you check that first. Okay. Uh, L'Hopital's rule, oops. L'Hopital's rule does not apply to zero over infinity, for example. Okay. So that's important. Okay. So, uh, and another thing to notice is, we already talked about it, but notice that we have f prime of x over g prime of x, right? And these are individual derivatives. Oops, ah, they jumped around here. It won't let me write the S, but that's okay. Individual derivatives, right? Not the quotient rule. Okay. I will say this. It will be tempting to, to just apply L'Hopital's rule everywhere for all the limits, right? We're going to have to do limits on the final exam. But uh, restrain yourself, right? So once you learn L'Hopital's rule, you'll want to apply it to everything, right? But it'll only work for these special cases where you end up at zero over zero or infinity over infinity, right? So that's something to keep in mind. And uh, the, there's going to be one question on the final exam where you get to do L'Hopital's rule. And the other ones, you may not use L'Hopital's rule. So it'll say, use L'Hopital's rule to evaluate this limit. Um, and I know I, I keep warning you guys, we haven't done any, you guys don't know how, how easy it makes things, but uh, I'm kind of putting the brakes on early here. So uh, I will say that it will be tempting, I promise it will be tempting to use L'Hopital's rules for, for all limits, to use L'Hopital's rule uh, I'll say for many limits. Some of them, if you plug in the values, it actually works out, right? Especially if you have a polynomial, um, right? For many limits, but you must first confirm that it's in indeterminate form or of indeterminate form. I'm not sure how to use that word. Is it of? Anyways, it wasn't clear to me. Uh, so, but you must confirm that the limit is of indeterminate form. And then I'll follow it up with here. Uh, there will be one question on the final 
question on the final, and there's also one on the quiz, of course. Uh, there will be one question on the final, uh, and it will say, use L'Hopital's rule explicitly. And it will say, use L'Hopital's rule. explicitly, right? Otherwise, you should be using the, uh, the, the techniques that we've learned, right, that we learned earlier in the course, right? So otherwise, use the techniques from chapter two. Okay, I think we're ready for an example. Let's see this thing in action. Okay. Example one. Okay. I want to find, uh, I don't know how many questions are on the final. I have one that I'll be working off of. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Let's Sometimes see. it, Sorry. pardon? Uh, considering that we have three hours for that final, there's probably going to be a few. Yeah, <laughs> and especially because some of them would like on a written exam would be written into like one ABC, but then they are now called three different questions. So it's going to sound like a lot, but some of them are like quick. Um, some of them are, are, you know, a little bit longer, but um, I can, let me just check actually how many are in there right now, just so you have an idea. Uh, oh, because um, that's a good, good question. Mm -hmm. Bird sniper. Sign in, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Have you ever seen that XKCD e comic from years back about nerd sniping? <laughs> no. Oh. I have 23 questions on here right now. But like I said, some of those would be like little tiny subparts. So, yeah. Um, oh, nice. I'm I'm looking at it right now. Wait. Uh... <laughs> 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 that is really a wonderful, funny. A wonderful grain of truth to it, doesn't it? <laughs> that is really funny. Oh my goodness. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see here. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is uh, we, we always try to plug in the value, right? So as x goes to one, okay, the, uh, the log of, or the natural log of one uh, is going to go to zero, right? Thinking about the, the graph of the log, right? Kind of looks like, like this, so it's gonna go to zero. It will be really useful to remember some of those common graphs, like uh, one over x, right? Kind of looks like this. Uh, this is one over x, and then uh, like this is the log of x, right? E to the x uh, looks like right. So some of these. 
uh, it'll make it a lot easier to think about these limits uh, if you kind of remember what the graphs look like. And I know that's not fun, but um, but some of them are going to come up again and again. Let me just pull this. It's on the same page. Okay. So uh, if we want to find the limit as x goes to 1 of the natural log of x over x minus 1, right, we find that uh, this is going to go to 0, right, as x goes to 1, because here the log of x is at 1, uh, sorry, 1, 0. So that's fine, zero in the numerator, that's not a problem. The problem comes when this is also going to go to zero as x goes to one. One minus one is zero, right? And so here we see that we have this indeterminate form. So therefore, this is of indeterminate form. And I like to just say which type of indeterminate form, just to emphasize mostly to myself that, okay, I checked it, it's zero over zero. Okay, this means that I can apply L'Hopital's rule. Okay, uh, so we can use L'Hopital's rule. You can abbreviate it LH if you want. Uh, and sometimes what we do is uh, I'm going to write out the, the original limit here. The limit as x goes to 1 of the natural log of x over x minus 1. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll put a little LH to indicate, OK, here I'm applying L'Hopital's rule. And I must have got that from somewhere because I I don't know, I don't make up math stuff, uh, but I didn't see it in the textbook. So, uh, but I, I think it's kind of a common thing. So here, this means applying L'Hopital's rule. Mostly as a note to myself, how how did this thing change so drastically, right? Because L'Hopital's rule says, okay, let's go back to L'Hopital's rule and say, okay, we've confirmed that it's of zero, zero, the, the indeterminate form, so great. Then I can rewrite the limit as x goes to one of f of x over g of x as the limit as x goes to one still, but of the derivative over the derivative. So I still have the limit as x goes to 1, and that's important, right? You still have to take the limit, but it's going to be an easier limit. The derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x over the derivative of x minus 1 is just 1, right? 1 minus 0. Now, all of a sudden, I've kind of uh, shaking out the problem with going to one, right? If I plug in x equals one here, there's no, there's no problem anymore. One over one is one, one over one is one, 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 right? So this becomes one over, oops, one over one over one, which is just gonna be one. Hey, not bad, right? What about another example? Let's do example two. Okay. So now I'm taking the limit as x goes to infinity, okay? and if I'm looking at e to the x, again, this is where it's going to be helpful to remember what e to the x looks like, right? e to the x uh, looks like this. 
So as x goes to infinity, e to the x is also going to infinity, right? And so the limit as x goes to infinity, whoops, of e to the x over x squared, this is going to infinity and infinity squared, or if you want to think about uh, the parabola, right, x squared, that's fine too, but either way, you're going to be going to infinity, both positive infinity. Remember, we're allowing for positive or negative infinity, and, and we can have a combination of them in the numerator and denominator, um, as long as it's of the form infinity over infinity. So, this is of the form infinity over infinity. So we can use L'Hopital's rule, which I'll just say LH, just so we don't write the same thing a billion times. Yeah, so you could totally have something like negative infinity over positive infinity. That's, that's fine. It would still be classified as infinity over infinity. Uh, so now I'm going to write out this limit again, the limit uh, of e to the x over x squared. And here, just a note to myself, I'm applying L'Hopital's rule because I have confirmed that I can. <clears throat> so the derivative of e to the x, well, the limit stays the same. The limit as x goes to infinity, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. The derivative of x squared is 2x. Okay. Uh, what happened? Plug in x going to infinity, I get infinity. Okay, fine. 2 times infinity is still going to go to infinity, right? So what we would do here is we would apply L'Hopital's rule again, right? You can keep doing it until you've whittled it down to something that either gets you at infinity, right? So if this was infinity over one, then the answer is infinity, right? There's nothing you can do about that. Um, but in this case, right, we can keep taking the derivative. And so here we see that this is going to infinity and this is going to infinity again. <clears throat> So we apply LH again. So then uh, how do I want to write it? I'm going to move this limit over to the left hand side. So then the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x over 2x, applying L'Hopital's rule again, I get the limit as x goes to infinity. e to the x is not going to change, right? But the derivative of 2x just puts me at 2. So now infinity divided by 2 is still going to be infinity, right? Because infinity just behaves that way, uh, kind of unstoppable. So this becomes infinity over two. So the limit is infinity, right? So this thing will go to infinity and, uh, and that's okay. Good. <clears throat> I've included example five as a cautionary tale. Okay, so it is involving trig functions, which I don't know, I don't love trig functions. Uh, I guess we have to kind of get along with them. But um, if you think about sine x as it goes to pi from the left, okay, um, that's going to go to zero, right. And so you kind of have to remind yourself, okay, what 
uh, either the unit circle, right? Sine is the y value on the unit circle. So if you're going to pi from the left, you're approaching y equals zero, right? So, okay, sine x is going to go to zero, but then uh, one minus cos x, so the cosine of x is actually going to, to one, right? And so one minus one, uh, wait. One minus cos x does not approach zero. It doesn't. One minus one. Oh, x is negative one. What I'm doing, so here, I'll copy this whole thing in. Oh, you don't have to copy it out or anything. We're just going to talk about it. What I was forgetting, ah, what's going on here? Think about your unit circle. Right, pi is over here. Pi is at negative one, zero, right? And so the sine, sine of pi is zero and the cosine of pi is negative one. Oh, you can't see the negative one. So then if you think about one minus negative one doesn't go to zero and so you don't have a uh, zero over zero. In fact, you can just plug it in and find that the limit is zero uh, without any hiccups. Okay, so this example, I'm calling it a cautionary tale. Right, where you don't want to just apply L'Hopital's rule because it's fun and easy. Right, uh, you have to make sure that you have that indeterminate form first. Okay. Okay. What are some other ways that we could manipulate this? Because at face value, L'Hopital's rule is, is kind of fun to wrap your head around. It's kind of easy once you get the, the hang of it. Uh, and so sometimes we'll even want to manipulate things like this to use L'Hopital's rule. even if you have a product, and there are some other situations in the textbook, but I didn't want to spend too much time in here. We're going to focus on uh, quotients, so fractions, right? And, but I just want to show you uh, that it, it, you can make it work for products as well. And you can make it work for differences um, and sums, I think. But anyways, we're not, we're not going to bother with that. We're going to focus on quotients. I'll show you how to work with products, right? So key thing here is that we can rewrite a product as, as a fraction, right? As a quotient. Um, so here, if we just kind of break down, uh, let's see here, the limit as x goes to zero from the right of x times the natural log of x, well, if we pretend, right, x is going to zero, so then we have zero times, and then here, as x goes to, and remember what the natural log graph looks like, right? We've got this uh, vertical asymptote at x equals zero, and it's heading down to negative infinity as x approaches zero from the right. So really useful to remember what these graphs look like. Um, oops. So this is going to be going to negative infinity. Yeah. So what we can do is, well, face value, there's uh, nothing we can do here, right? So we can try to rewrite this as a fraction. We can try rewriting x times the log of x as a fraction. The 
thing is, we actually end up with with two uh, two options. It does not matter which one. Uh, it, we're going to do both. Actually, I want to do them side by side, um, just to show you that you you can you can do either one. One's going to end up being easier, so then we abandon the the second one. But um, so. First thing we're going to do is let's rewrite the limit as x goes to zero from the right of x log x as the limit as x goes to zero from the right of our first option is to keep the natural log of x in the numerator and then rewrite the times x in the denominator by writing it as one over x. These two are equivalent, right? If I have a fraction over a fraction, I can flip and multiply, and then all of a sudden I'm back to where I started. So you can rewrite uh, products as a fraction always. And maybe what I'll do is make some room here and actually do them side by side. Uh, we have two options. Okay. That's option number one. And I'll do like a little dot, dot dot here. The second option is to keep the x in the numerator and rewrite the, the log of x in the denominator as one over x. Right? Same, same procedure here. The limit as x goes to zero from the right of x log of x is the same as the limit as x goes to zero from the right of x over one over the log of x. Okay. Surveying the scene, right? We would give up on this one pretty quickly. The reason for that is one over the log of x. There's no way I can I can rewrite that easily because I would have to use the quotient rule, right? And so uh, the quotient rule kind of makes a mess down here. Whereas one over x, I can rewrite as x to the negative one and easily find that derivative, and then uh, it it makes it easier to look at, right? And so this kind of gets uh, tricky to deal with when we take the, the derivative. It actually becomes a, a, a harder function to deal with than what we started with. So here, taking the derivative yields a, a more difficult function than the original, so we abandon it. Yields a more difficult function, right? But if you're having a hard time deciding how to rewrite this thing, just try both and you'll see pretty quickly which one's gonna be easier to deal with. Uh, so taking the derivative yields a more difficult function than the original. So we abandon it. Okay. So we're going to focus on, on this one here, right? If I apply L'Hopital's rule here, I'm still taking the limit as x goes to zero from the right. The derivative of the natural log of x is one over x. The derivative of, oops, uh, x to the negative one, right, is negative one times x to the negative two, negative x negative two, right, just rewriting that one over x. We can simplify this before we let x go to zero from the right. So here this becomes the limit as x goes to zero from the right of one over x times the negative x squared, right? This is the negative one over x squared. 
flip and multiply. So negative x squared, which again is the limit as x goes to zero from the right of the negative x squared over x is just x. Won't, won't. Let, it, let x go to zero, it doesn't matter about the negative, right? And so our overall limit here is zero. And maybe what I'll do is I'll put this all on the same page so it's not, oh, come on. Uh, it's not all broken up. Okay. So we can manipulate some functions so that we can apply L'Hopital's rule, right? But again, we have to make sure that um, oh, I guess I didn't check. Ha. Let me bump this down. Okay, things are going to get weird here because I'm going to use this space here to make sure that these are indeterminate forms. They are, uh, but uh, you can write it below too. We have two options for rewriting x times the log of x. Option number one is the log of x over one over x. This is going to go to negative infinity as x goes to zero from the right. And this 1 over x is going to uh, 1 over x as it's approaching zero positive infinity. Yeah. As x goes to zero from the right. And the other option is to write x over the log of x. x goes to 0 as x goes to 0 from the right. And the log of x, oh, sorry, this is 1 over the log of x. One over negative infinity goes to 0. as x goes to zero from the right. Sorry, I should have done that first. I had them as like very subtle notes in my notes. Sorry. Okay, so we did, we did confirm that we have this indeterminate form of infinity over infinity. Or zero over zero. So we were allowed to apply L'Hopital's rule, but I should have checked it. Okay. So good. Are we ready for some optimization problems? Uh, do you guys want a break before we go into optimization? Or are you good to I'm feeling in the groove, so best not to interrupt <laughs> a bit. Yeah, sometimes it's like, okay, let's let's just keep going. Um, if you need a break, you can take a break. But let's keep going. Put this on a fresh page here. It's our very last section, and it's pretty fun. Not as fun as Locatel's rule. I'll give you that bet. Uh, 4.7 is, is, uh, like the most, uh, realistic applied, um, applied thing that we do in this course. And so it's kind of appropriate that we end on a high note. So, um, optimization problems. So, we know 
that we can use derivatives to find maximums and minimums, right? We've actually developed, I, I wanna say three different methods in this chapter, right? 4.1, uh, we can use the, the closed interval method to find uh, maximums and minimums. We'll review it because we're gonna use it. Uh, we can use the first derivative test, right? If the derivative is, is negative, you're decreasing and then you're increasing, so that gives you a minimum, so on. Uh, you can even use the second derivative test. It only works in certain situations, right? But if you have, if you're going from concave up to concave I don't know, something about a concavity. We don't use it that much. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Concave. Concave okay. up is um, the one with the minimum. Concave down would be the one with the maximum. Wouldn't it? Oh yeah, if you're, that's what it is. If you're at a critical number and it is concave up at that point, then it's a minimum. And if you're at a critical number and it's concave down, then that critical number is a maximum. Three different ways of finding mins and maxes. And the reason for that, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> um, uh, so optimization, you want to maybe minimize the cost of making something, maximize the profit. Usually I, I tend towards business examples, right? Because uh, that's usually uh, where the money is. Um, but uh, it, it, it can be anything, right? So optimization really means find the minimum or the maximum. So optimization usually, or, or I'm tempted to say always, but uh, optimization means finding the minimum or the maximum. Or the maximum of something of whatever. Right? So we can use derivatives to find minimums and maximums. Right? So we can use derivatives to find mins and max. And I, I am going to pull in uh, the little blurbs from that we're going to be talking about. So, uh, Um, yeah, the closed interval method is one that we're going to be using. So I'm just, this is from 4.1. Remember, you have an absolute maximum or minimum. So we are concerned with max, absolute maximums and minimums. Uh, and it assumes that we have a continuous function, which we will most likely on some closed interval, right? So the closed interval method assumes we have a closed interval. Uh, and it says, find the critical numbers, evaluate the function at the critical numbers, but also at the endpoints. Uh, and then pick the maximum or the minimum depending on what you want to find, right? So that's that's one option. Or from 4.3, we had uh, the first derivative test. So this is from 4.3. Notice here, so we have to find critical numbers again. Okay, fine. Uh, it is talking about local maximums and minimums. 
right? And so maybe we're not really interested in local maximums and minimums, but we're going to have an example of that as well. So sometimes if you don't have a closed interval, then you are going to have to use the first derivative test, right? So in general, um, if you do not have a closed interval, use the first derivative test. Okay. The second derivative test, uh, it still gives you, and this is the one that I kind of mumbled my way through because we don't use it that much. It's like a very specific case. And we even saw that it didn't really work for us last day. So the second derivative says that if you have a critical number at C where the critical number is that the derivative is zero, right? So that was an important part. Uh, then as long as the second derivative is either greater than zero, less than zero, we run into trouble and we have to use the first derivative test if it's equal to zero. We saw that last day. So then we can use this to, to find a local max or min. Okay, but focus your attention on, uh, on these two, right? So first stop, closed interval method. If you have a closed interval, great, use it. If you don't have a closed interval, then, uh, then we'll use the first derivative test. So, okay. In the handout, it does include the steps. So a lot of these steps are, are kind of um, pretty, pretty self-explanatory such as read the problem carefully. Uh, that's easier said than done, actually. Uh, sometimes it, it takes a long time to wrap your head around the problem, right? Start by drawing a diagram, kind of try to sort out the information that you have, uh, and then do things like introducing notation. For all of these problems, there will be two variables involved. You'll want to uh, rewrite one of those variables in terms of the other. Okay, so and I think that's um, yeah. So if q is the function that you're going to try to maximize or minimize, then if it's a function of more than one variable, use the given information to find relationships. So we're going to try to rewrite. Um, rewrite the function in terms of one variable, right? And sometimes one will be easier to find than the other. Okay. You want to write the domain here because uh, if you have a closed interval for the domain, then you can use the closed interval method. If you don't have a closed interval, right? If x just can be greater than zero, uh, then you have to use the first derivative test. But you'll find that when you try to, to do the problem too. Uh, and then find the absolute max and mins. Um, and it even says, if the domain of f is a closed interval, then the closed interval method can be used. So a lot of these assume that you know uh, area, formulas and volume formulas, you can easily look these up online, right? And so, uh, of course, the area of a rectangle is easy enough. So I, I want to use this one to start with. Uh, and maybe I'll just grab the whole kit and caboodle here. I'll put it on a fresh page. Okay. So a farmer has 2,400 feet of fencing and wants to fence off a rectangular field that borders a straight river. Now, imagine that you didn't have 
this graphic, right? You want to try to visualize, okay, what, what does this problem look like? Okay, I basically have a three-sided rectangle. Uh, and then what are the dimensions of the field that has the largest area? Right. And so here are a couple of options. We can consider some different options, right? We can make it uh, really shallow, right? Uh, kind of a, a width of 100 making, because I want to use up all 2,400 uh, feet of fencing, right? So that makes uh, the length of it 2,200 feet. We could find the area here, right? Uh, we could consider a couple of different options. Notice that the really flat one, as well as the really skinny one, yield relatively small areas compared to 700 square feet. Right. And so here, notice that these, oops, that these yield relatively small areas. So that tells us that, okay, probably somewhere in between is where we want to be, right? But we want to figure out the exact measurements for, uh, let's call them X and Y, because that's what we're going to be uh, calling them. Okay. So in general, what this thing looks like, well, I've got my my river here, boop, 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 boop. right? And I'm just going to draw an arbitrary rectangle here, and I'm going to use x and y values. I I tend to like to use x and y whenever I can, but uh, you can use whatever variables you want, a and b, but x has to be the same length on both sides because I'm pretty sure it said a rectangular, yeah, a rectangular field adds another uh, layer of difficulty if, it, if you wanted a triangular field, right? So here we're focusing on a rectangle. So uh, both of these sides have to be the same. This side does not have to be the same, so we'll let it be uh, y. We also know, so kind of going from here, we also know that x plus y plus x has to add up to 2400, right? So we know that x plus x, or maybe I'll go kind of around, x plus y plus x has to be 2400 which means 2x plus y has to be 2400. Right. Just jotting down everything that we know so far. Right. I also know that I want to, and it's, it's good to kind of highlight when you're starting, uh, what, what do I want to minimize or maximize? Well, what are the dimensions of the field that has the largest area? So what I want to maximize is the area. Want to maximize the area. The area for a rectangle is nice and nice and easy, right? So the area is width times the length, right? X times Y. So I want to maximize this. So it asks for the dimension. So it's actually asking for what is the X and the Y, but you use uh, the maximized value of A to find those. So, okay. Here's where we hit that snag where, okay, what I want to maximize is the area but the area is in terms of two different variables, 
right? So you want to rewrite one of these variables in terms of the other. So rewrite one of these variables in terms of the other. Right, so that the, the function is only in terms of the one variable. This is where we resort to, okay, well, I know that 2x plus y has to equal 2400. You could solve for x here and then write everything in terms of y. Looks a little bit easier to solve for y, right? So because it's easier to solve for y, I'm going to rewrite this y in terms of x. And so um, it is easier. You'll arrive at the same conclusion if you rewrote in terms of y, but it's easier to rewrite. And this is just in this case uh, to rewrite y in terms of x because we have 2x plus y equals 2400. So y must be 2400 minus 2x. So kind of pick whichever one is the easiest. Uh, or another thing that I would consider is if I have a lot of x's, right? Maybe it's xy plus 2x plus 4x squared. Maybe that's my area function. Uh, I don't want to replace all those x's. I would rather replace the, the one y or something like that, right? So it, it takes some practice, but uh, you'll, you'll see which one is easier to replace. OK, so then if I replace this y in my area function with this y, right, I'm allowed to do that. So then here, the area is x times y, which is x times 2400 minus 2x. So now the area is only in terms of x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a of x. I just emphasize that I've managed to make it just in terms of, um, of x. Let's keep an eye out for the domain of a of x, right? So it, sometimes it'll it'll just require you talking it out, right? And so uh, we know we know some things, right? We know two x plus y has to equal twenty four hundred. So the largest value of x that I could have, right, is if y is zero. Then I've really maximized it. It has no length. Right, but you've maximized this this um, width, right? But there have to, has to, you have to have two of them. So then the maximum x is is twelve hundred, right? And then so here, so for the domain, uh, since two x plus y has to be twenty four hundred, right? Uh, let y be 0. So then 2x plus 0 is 2,400. Tells me that x being 1,200 uh, is the largest possible value of x. Vice versa, right? You could have the, the entire 2400 just flat on the river, uh, not really making a rectangle because the width is zero, but, but in theory, that is the, the option and it's the smallest option for x. Okay. And x equals zero is the smallest value of x. possible. Okay. 
So what that means is that X, X must be between 1200, well, between zero and 1200. This means I have a closed interval. Which is good news, because then I can use that closed interval method. Okay. So I've got the domain. Okay, so I found that it's a closed interval. Now I can go back to well, I've rewritten the area function in terms of just x. Okay, so now I can uh, I can maximize the area function. Okay. So now, now we can maximize the area function. First thing I have to do, right, if I'm going to use the closed interval method or the first derivative test, I have to find the critical numbers, right? And so I need to find the derivative of this thing and set it equal to zero or figure out values where it doesn't exist, right? Those would be critical numbers as well, but um, we're not really gonna have to deal with that. So the direct or A of X was, I'll expand it 2400 X minus two X squared. because I don't wanna to have to deal with a fake product rule. Yuck. So then the derivative of this thing is 2400 minus four X. <laughs> For the closed interval method, Right, we know that, okay, this, this uh, is gonna happen, the maximum or the minimum is gonna happen at the critical number. And the critical number is when the derivative is 2400 minus four X is equal to zero. Oh, haha, thank you. <laughs> Good, hey, that would have made a real mess. Thank you, Jasper. Um, uh, that. Oh. No, that I didn't. Uh, no, because it's derived. Ergo, that x turns into one times yeah. twenty four hundred. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. We take the derivative here. Yeah, I know. I saw that x and I. Oh shoot! I did forget it. Yeah. Good. Uh, okay, good. Uh, let's see here. So we're going to find the value of x where the derivative is zero. So that is our critical number. There are no values of x where the, the derivative doesn't exist, right? It's a polynomial. So that's not an issue. So we're only concerned with where it equals zero. So I have I have 2400 is equal to 4x, so then x is uh, 600. Okay. okay, so that means that the maximum or the minimum, in, in this case, uh, we're looking for the maximum. They're going to happen at the endpoints or at the critical number by the closed interval method. We can use the closed interval method. To find that uh, the area at well, the area of X, let me just jot it down, was, here's where that X comes back, 2400 minus, or X minus two X squared. So at the critical number A of 600, there's only one critical number, so that's, that's fine. Uh, puts me at 2400 times 600, 
minus two times 600 squared. I'm just gonna jot it down here. My other consideration is at the left end point, A of zero, right? Because we said, okay, X is gonna go from zero to 1200, which is of course just zero, but I'll write it out. And also the right end point. A of 1200. 2400 times 1200 minus 2 times 1200 squared is also zero. Makes sense, right? If you're uh, if you have no width, then everything is on the on the river, so you have an area of zero. Or if you have all the width, no length, then the area is still zero, right? So it, it makes sense. So then, if we're looking for the maximum value. The maximum area out of these three is definitely this 7200. So the maximized area is 7200 square feet. If you forget to put the units on, that's totally fine. Um, and this happens when x was 600, which means what? Then the y must be, so 600 times 2 is 1,200, so then y must also be uh, 1,200. So when x, oops, when x is 600 and y is So we've maximized the area, and that's exactly what we wanted to do. So it's definitely going to be a multi-step problem. You're given some information, you have to collect that information, rewrite the, the thing you want to maximize or minimize in terms of one of those variables, and then you can apply the methods that we've learned to find the maximum or the minimum, and then you can start putting it back together. So uh, kick it up a notch. Let's do another example here. So a cylindrical can, so it looks, you know, like any can, uh, is to be made to hold one liter of oil. Okay. Find the dimensions that will minimize the cost of the metal to manufacture the can. So if you want to minim minimize the cost of the metal, really what you're trying to minimize is the area of the metal. Right, so, so that's kind of implied, and that's what can be really tricky about, um, about these problems. Right? So they've, they've uh, got the graphs or the kind of the, the images to help us along, right? But to minimize the cost of the metal really means to find the minimum area right? of, the, of the metal of the outside. Okay, so we've got uh, this cylindrical cam with some radius r because all our formulas are going to be in terms of the radius uh, as well as the height, right? And so we know, we know, right? Uh, we might need our refresher, right? But the area of a circle is, is pi r squared. So we have two of those, right? The bottom and the top. And it even says here, the area for these two components is two pi r squared. And then the area for, for this thing, you can kind of cut up the middle and, and it becomes this uh, rectangle, right? So the circumference around the, 
around the can is two pi r, so that kind of becomes the length of this thing uh, times the height, which is whatever the height of the can is. So the area here is two pi r h. So a couple of different components, slightly harder formula for the area to deal with, right? Uh, but let's just jot down things that we know, right? Sometimes if I if I read this uh, these types of problems, I need some time to really kind of uh, sort through all the information that I've been given. So uh, we are told that the volume is fixed at one liter. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change that into a thousand centimeters cubed because the area is going to be in centimeters, right? And that's just a, a relationship between liters and, uh, and volume or volume to volume. So this is a thousand centimeters cubed. Never mind that it's oil in it. I think it only a, truly applies to water, but anyways, doesn't matter. Um, volume is volume, I guess. So maybe it's the white, the the weight that I'm thinking of. One liter weighs one kilo, but it's one liter of water weighs one kilo. That's I think that's what I'm thinking of. Anyways, uh, doesn't matter. So we've. We've got the one liter under control, right? So we know that the volume has to be one liter and we know that we can rewrite the area uh, because well, one, it's been given to us or you could develop it, right? But we also know that the area, we want to minimize the area, which is, 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h from, from the figure. There are some times where you might need to develop those areas, right? They're not given to you in a figure, so it might be nice to uh, but you can easily Google your way to, um, to it. Okay. So we have the area is, rewrite it here, 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h. Now, we know we want to rewrite this thing in terms of one variable, right? Here I've got r and I have h. Because I have multiple R's, what I'm going to opt for is I want to rewrite H in terms of R. Rewrite H in terms of R. All right, it just seems like the easiest thing to do here. You could rewrite R in terms of H, that's fine, but it'll make, make things a lot harder. It still work. Uh, okay, we know that the volume of this thing uh, is the base times the height, so it's pi r squared, let me just make sure, yeah, pi r squared times h. Okay, so again, one of those volume of a cylinder things that you should probably have, you know, available. The volume of a cylinder is uh, pi r squared h. And we were told that this has to be a thousand. So now I can solve for h, so then h must be a thousand over pi r squared. So now I can I can rewrite a as a function of only r because I'm able to swap out h for a thousand over pi r squared. So the area with respect to r, or in terms of r, is two pi r squared plus two pi 
r times h, which is now being replaced with a thousand over pi r squared. There's some cancellation going on here, right? Pi over pi, r over r squared, two times a thousand. So I can rewrite this. This becomes two pi r squared plus 2000 over r. Let's, now that we have our function just in terms of r, now let's take a step back and consider our domain for r, right? And there's really no restrictions except that this can has to exist. You can't minimize it to, well, the cheapest thing to do is to not make a can. Uh, is uh, technically an option, but not really, right? And so the radius has to be larger than zero. So the domain uh, R must be greater than zero must be greater than zero. But there's actually no upper bound on the radius. The cylinder could be, uh, you know, in theory, because we're limited to a liter, there is an upper bound. But for us, because we want to minimize this radius, uh, we're just going to let this upper bound be whatever, and we're not going to worry about it. So R must be greater than zero. Uh, but no upper limit on R. Technically there is because we're limited to a thousand, but I also just want to show you what happens if you don't have a closed interval, right? And so this is saying that R must be greater than zero. So now we don't, so this is not a closed interval. Huh? Mostly because I wanted to show you how to deal with this if it was not a closed interval. Okay, so we, we still want to minimize this area. Okay. So we know what to do. We have to find our critical numbers. So uh, find the critical numbers, the derivative of a with respect to r is uh, 4 pi r plus, oh, but I guess this is 2,000 times r to the negative 1, so it becomes minus 1 minus 2,000 over r squared. Bumping it, bumping that r up and then down in the derivative. So uh, I'll put this over a common denominator just because then it'll be easier to work with. So I get 4 pi r to the 3 minus 2,000 all over r squared. which if I want to simplify some things, I can pull out a four, a common four times pi r to the three minus 500 over r squared. The denominator cannot make the derivative equal to zero. So the only time that we can make this equal to zero um, Oh, I multiplied this r by r squared over r squared. I got that common denominator times r squared over r squared. But I did it secretly. So this chunk is the only thing that I could use to make the derivative zero. So uh, this is the only thing that can make 
a prime of r equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on, you can look at it overall, right? In general, only the numerator can make things zero. So if you wanted to keep it as four pi r to the three minus 2000, that's fine too, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to whittle it down a little bit. So what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, a prime of r is zero when pi r to the three minus 500 equals zero. So now I can solve for r that makes that happen and it gets a little bit weird because I end up taking the third root, but I end up with r is the third root of 500 over pi. That's okay. You can find that this is a number on your calculator, right? So this is the exact value. Uh, so that's fine. You have to use the exact value in your calculations, but that's the only tricky part. Uh, we only have one critical number, which is when r is the third root of 500 over pi. And because we don't have a closed interval, we can't use the closed interval method. Uh, and because we do not have a closed interval, we use the first derivative test. Okay. The first derivative test says that, okay, we'll make a, make a kind of a, a timeline here and say here I'm at R is the third root of 500 over pi. That's my critical number. Then the first derivative test, and it's way up at the top, uh, or if you go to the 4.3 notes, um, then uh, I'm not gonna scroll there because it gets really laggy, but uh, so the first derivative test says that, okay, if it's, if you're decreasing, meaning that the derivative is negative coming into the critical number and then it switches to increasing, uh, meaning the derivative is, is positive, right? Then you're at a minimum and that's, that's what we want. So we're only concerned with minimums here, but uh, what we'll find is it might be easier to think about uh, an actual test value. Sometimes I like to think about general values, but uh, in this case, it might be easier to think of um, exact uh, values. Now, this is approximately 5.419. That's going to help us pick test values, right, to see the behavior of the derivative uh, coming into the critical number and leaving the critical number. So I might pick a test number like, uh, I don't know, let's do one. That's nice. The radius has to exist, so the radius can't be negative, right? But let's do try it at r equals one, and maybe uh, we'll see the behavior at r equals 10. Just picking kind of nice-ish values to test this thing at. So I want to see the behavior of the derivative, which was 4 times pi r to the 3 minus 500 over r squared, which at our test number, and you could have picked any number, 1, over one, trying to 
highlight those test numbers in pink there. Okay. Well, I get uh, a positive, sorry, a negative number. Pi minus, so one to the power of three is, is just one. Pi minus 500 is negative. One squared is positive. A negative times four is still negative, right? So that's really all that I'm interested in is looking at the sign, right? And so this becomes a negative. Which means that this thing is, is decreasing, right? So this tells me that uh, the function or the area is decreasing. Okay. So you're kind of approaching the critical number as you approach a radius of roughly 5.419. So you get closer and closer. Oh, I can keep decreasing, keep decreasing. And then what if we think about uh, the other side, right? If we leave the critical number, we're hoping to see a positive value now, right? Because I wanna be increasing because that gives me that minimum. Uh, A prime of R is again, four times pi R to the three minus 500 over R squared which is four times pi. I picked pi or r is 10 over 10. 10 to the three minus 500 over 10 squared. If you do same thing, right? This is positive, four is positive. So it depends on the sign in here, right? 10 to the power of three times pi minus 500, that's gonna be positive. And so here, this becomes a positive. So here, once you hit this point, uh, the area starts, the area is increasing. with no other critical numbers that we could find, right? We didn't find any other critical numbers. What we'll say is that this is an absolute minimum. Since there are no other critical numbers, we can say this is an absolute, oops, an absolute minimum, right? Decreasing, increasing. So, because what this looks like, right? So here I'm, I'm decreasing and then at the critical number, I start to increase again. Okay. All right. Good. So then we have this absolute minimum when the, the radius is this kind of nasty third root of 500 over pi or roughly 5.419. Okay. So I, the area is minimized. when r is the third root of 500 over pi and h, remember h is, I'm just gonna grab it from my notes here, but it is also in your notes, a uh, thousand over pi r squared. Okay, so if I plug in and I'm, trying to keep it on the same page here. Maybe I should just give up. So H is going to be a thousand divided by pi times the third root of 500 over pi 
then square that. Huh, okay. Uh, this is not, not that beautiful, right? What I'm gonna do is to simplify this. I mean, technically this is a number. You, you could find a number here from here, but that's not, you know, you're, you're pretending that you're handing this over to your boss. And your boss is like, what am I supposed to do with this? Oh yeah, easy. You just make the, the height a thousand over pi times the third root of 500 um, pi, 500 over pi squared. Easy. Oh, that's not very good. So then here, a couple of things that I'm gonna do is, well, first I'm gonna use my exponent laws, right? So I have a thousand over pi, and then I've got, let's see here, the third root and then squared is the same thing as two over three, right? The power of two over three, which I can bring in inside. So this is times 500 to the power of two over three over pi to the power of two over three. I've got a base of pi, base of pi. I could also make, uh, I could split this up into two times 500, right? So then I get two times 500 over pi to the one times, oops, that should be times pi to the negative two over three times 500 to the negative two over three, kind of skipping some stuff, but I'm rearranging with the exponents. So now, because these have the same base, right? This is 500 to the power of one. One minus two thirds is one third. One minus two thirds is one third again. So I have two times 500 to the power of one over three over pi to the one over three, which is two times the third root of 500 over pi, which feels familiar because this is also R. So H is really just gonna have to be two R. And I know that's, that's a lot of steps to go through there, but um, I mean, on web assign, it's just asking for the numbers. So you could have figured out what this value was way up here, right? But I just wanted to show you how to simplify it. And it also has this cool property of, uh, well, the height has to be two times the radius to max, or sorry, to minimize it. Uh, two times the radius is actually the diameter, right? So you can keep making these connections, but um, this is also, also the diameter. So therefore, the cost of the can, let's just say the can, not the materials of the can, even though it is, uh, is minimized when r is the third root of 500 over pi and h is 2 times r. And there is another example on there, but uh, what I can do is I can write out the solution in the notes. It's a little bit trickier. We want to minimize uh, the time that it takes them to. So have a, have a read through it. I'm not going to put something like this on a quiz or a test. It's just kind of, okay. How do, we, how do we handle this thing? Uh, but also, most importantly, can you believe it? We're done. I'll throw in the, the last example, how to work through it uh, in case you're interested, but otherwise, uh, you did it. Woo -woo. Party time.
How's it feel? <laughs> Not party time. Finishing up the assignments, <laughs> we still have time. <laughs> party time is after finals. <laughs> But I always like this point where it's like, okay, that's all the material. Okay, when you have like an overview of all the possible things that could happen, it's like, for some reason for me, it's easier to study. So hopefully you, you get that feeling too. There's no looming. Oh yes, we might still need to cover something else else exactly. to make this make more sense. <laughs> we, are, we have all the sense we're going to get for this course. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Uh, so, um, anyways, uh, have a look through. Uh, maybe try quiz eight, even if you know you don't do it for for marks. It might be good to kind of see it. Um, if you don't take it seriously, uh, you can can always just have a look at those questions, and because they will help you prepare for uh, for the tests. But anyways, if you uh, <laughs> do, do quiz it, it worst comes to worst, or then you, you get like a couple forgotten. percentiles and you had forgotten it in the quiz earlier or in the semester. Hey, presto, that's more marks. Easy peasy. Uh, if you do have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great weekend. Uh, and uh, I'll be here for the test. You don't have to be in the Zoom room. It's only if you have questions or um, anything comes up. But otherwise, test All right. is next Wednesday, yes? Yeah, test on All Wednesday. Right. And then we have anything next Friday? Uh, just review next Friday. Just review.